Let's talk about Emil Durkheim. Uh, Durkheim is my favorite sociologist. Uh, I think he is probably the greatest social scientist that ever lived. Very enthusiastic about Durkheim and uh, really happy to teach people about Durkheim's thinking. The issues that Durkheim was concerned about are the same issues that the other classical sociological thinkers were concerned about. Uh, how do societies move from uh, primordial forms to modern social forms? This is something that Comte worried about. This is something that Spencer theorized about. This is essential to Marx's sociological theorizing. So how is it that we got from our hunter-gatherer past to our postmodern present? Durkheim, Durkheim has some ideas about that, about how societies evolve. And uh, early sociology society like for Comte and for Spencer and for Marx, there were ideas about the perfect society. And here Durkheim is a little different from the uh, other sociologists. For example, uh, Comte and Spencer believed that societies, societies were evolving from primitive to uh, more advanced forms. Comte argued that we were in a superstitious theological stage and that we were moving towards this positivist utopia. Spencer believed that um, primitive people, peoples were close to a state of nature and they were essentially barbaric and that the process of survival of the fittest would hone and shape human nature until we arrived at this sort of libertarian utopia where government was not even necessary because people were so highly evolved that they could efficiently govern themselves without crime uh, and without antisocial behavior. So for people like, and even Marx believed that, you know, the end point of society was a glorious communist utopia. So Comte, Spencer, Marx, these are utopian thinkers. Uh, Durkheim's not that way, not that way at all. He's interested in the transition from primordial social forms to modern social forms, but he doesn't look at things in terms of progress. He believes in evolution, but the evolution is an evolution from uh, worse to better. Uh, it's just different. Primordial societies are different from modern societies, and primordial societies have good things about them and bad things about them, and modern societies have good things about them and bad things about them. And, you know, it's a matter of trade-offs, and we'll talk trade-offs, and we'll talk at length about uh, the way that Durkheim perceived societal evolution, because it's really sort of, uh, you know, a, a neutral way uh, of looking at things. In addition to the evolution of society, Durkheim was also concerned, as were the other classical sociological, sociological theorists, about human nature. What is human nature? Uh, we talked about how Marx's view of human nature is that people are uh, in their default state, living in a state of harmonious, egalitarian, primitive communalism. Um, and we also talked, also talked about uh, how Comte and Spencer got their ideas about human nature from the social contract theorists. And remember, this view uh, was a view that can trace its origins to the philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who argued that by nature human beings are selfish and uh, greedy, and that uh, uh, if they were left to their own devices, if they were left to their nature, they would uh, uh, destroy themselves in their uh, pursuit of their selfish uh, interests. And so the, what makes the state possible, what makes for large possible, is that people have essentially signed some sort of uncontracted contract. They agree to willingly give up some of their freedom um, in exchange for the opportunity to live together more or less harmoniously, and that individuals sort of sustain the state through this, through this kind of social contract. And Durkheim disagrees with this um, because he says, now, wait a second, did you sign any sort of contract? Are you aware of any sort of contract? This contract um, must be so implicit that the people who have agreed to the contract don't even know they've agreed to the contract. 
Now, Durkheim has an interesting view of this. You know, a Comte and uh, Spencer, who derive their ideas from Hobbes, think about individuals who come together to form the society. And Durkheim looks at it completely backwards. Durkheim agrees that society restrains the individual, but society is not a product of human will or of human overt efforts. For him, society is not comprised of individuals. It precedes individuals. Now, that's an odd idea. First, uh, individuals don't make society. Society makes individuals. And uh, he argues, look, everyone is born into a society. And so for him, society exists sui generis. That's his term, sui generis. Uh, it, it exists of itself. Uh, and so let me give you an example. That's an odd idea, but let me give you an example of how it works. Language, for example, predates all of us. Uh, you before you have any sort of opportunity to choose what you want your native language to be, it's already chosen for you. And virtually everybody is born into a situation where they have a native language. And the interesting thing about your native language is that not only does language allow you to take the thoughts that are in your head and uh, turn them into noises that allow your thoughts to travel into someone else's head, but we know how that language also shapes the way that we think, that your the language that you speak, your native language, also comes with it a sort of philosophy of the world or a way of looking uh, at the world. This is called the Worfian hypothesis, and it was um, uh, developed by an anthropologist named, uh, uh, two anthropologists, one named Sapir, one named Worf, and the idea is that Language shapes the way you see the world. So, for instance, uh, you think about patriarchy and sexism. Uh, what the Worfian hypo hypothesis would say is that the tendency to think about patriarchy and sexism is sort of built into the language. Think about terms like fireman or congressman. Um, and think how unwieldy terms like firewoman or congresswoman are. Uh, if we had st started out from a position of gender egalitarianism, uh, we wouldn't have a word like congressman to begin with. There'd be a sort of gender neutral word. But that word uh, came into being at a time when, you know, men were congressmen, where female congressmen were congress people were uh, incredibly rare. And what the Worf Worfian hypothesis says is that not only is the language a sort of artifact of sexism, it perpetuates sexism. So that when I use certain terms, like if I think if I say, you know, think about a doctor, most people are going to think about a male doctor. If I think about if I say think about a senator, most people are going to think about a male senator because the sexism is uh, not only reflected in the language, it is perpetuated in the language. And we see this, too, the other way with sort of feminized occupations. If I talk about a, a nurse, uh, oftentimes we will. Uh, uh, mark the, diff the difference between uh, the gender of nurses by talking about a male nurse. I mean, think about how feminized the profession of nurse must be if we have to modify it by saying a male nurse. Uh, this is even more pronounced in Spanish. Uh, if you think about, a, about a, a group of little boys, they're los niños. If you think about a group of little girls, they're las niñas. But if you have a group of little boys and little girls mixed together, what are they? Well, they're los niños. You use the masculine for a mixed group. Uh, and uh, uh, since my, since my uh, wife is a native Spanish speaker and uh, my daughter has encountered both, language, both languages, I remember uh, my daughter saying to me, now, wait a second, how come girls don't count when boys come in the room? I I thought about this observation because I heard my daughter talking about it. So in Spanish, um, uh, uh, sexism is perpetuated in the language by the way the very pronouns are used. So you can see that the language not only derives from a patriarchal epoch, but it also perpetuates a patriarchal epoch. 
Some things are more subtle uh, than that. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the things that I have noticed, being married to a native Spanish speaker, is that uh, in English we make a distinction between a lemon and a lime. But in many Spanish-speaking countries, both lemons and limes are just, are just limon. And what I have noticed uh, about native Spanish speakers is that because the word for lemon and lime is the same, they don't really differentiate between lemons and limes. Because the word is the same, they see them as the same. I could distinctively taste the difference between a, between a lemon and a lime, but I think my wife doesn't taste that distinction quite as much. So if uh, we're having Coronas and we want to put um, uh, a slice of citrus in with it. She might say, when I go to the store, get some limon. If I bring home green ones, fine with her, with her. If I bring home yellow ones, fine with her. She doesn't even notice the difference. And what I would say is perhaps she doesn't notice the difference because in her language, it's not different. So uh, this is how, why, one of the reasons why Durkheim says that you are born into society. Because language exists sui generis. So in primordial societies, before the existence of writing of any kind, language existed solely in the minds. There was no written form. Uh, and so in a very real sense, language sort of exists like it resides in your mind. Languages morph and shift on their own without any kind of overt direction. Think about the difference between uh, what words mean now and what they would have meant uh, a generation ago. So, for instance, if I say um, uh, uh, that spaghetti uh, is awesome, uh, uh, that spaghetti uh, is awesome, um, you know, these days the word awesome means great or terrific. But in the uh, a generation previous, it meant to inspire awe. You wouldn't use the word awesome to describe spaghetti. You would use the word a hurricane. Or think about the word incredible. If I say that spaghetti is incredible, it means that was delicious uh, spaghetti. But a generation ago, the word incredible meant not believable. Credible means to be believable, the prefix in, incredible, not, not believable. And you would never describe uh, a spaghetti as, you know, not believable. So the words awesome and incredible have changed their meaning. The most interesting word that has changed its meaning from my perspective is the word literally. The word literally, the word literally, the word literally now has morphed such that it means figure, figuratively. So for instance, when I say something like, I laughed so hard, I literally peed my pants. What I mean Literally is, I laughed so hard I figuratively pee, is now changing to mean the exact opposite of what it has always meant. Literally now means figuratively. Or think about a word like the word gay, uh, uh, the way it would have been used in 1950 versus 2018. Gay simply meant happy. Uh, but it came to be identified uh, with people with same-sex uh, preferences in um, uh, the, starting in the late 70s and, and uh, really sort of catching hold in the 90s. So if you, if you read a, sen a sentence in a book, suppose I say something to you like, think of this sentence. Um, here comes my old girlfriend. I'm going to smile and pretend I'm gay. Now, a statement like that made in 1950 would have meant, have meant, here comes my old girlfriend and I'm sad about our breakup, so I'm going to smile and pretend I'm happy, versus what it would mean in 2020, something like, you know, I don't want to have any sort of conversation about getting back together, or I don't want to deal with this situation, so to make sure that we don't have to have any discussion, uh, I'll just... Uh, I'll just tell her that there's, you know, she'll, I'll let her know that there's a problem that can't be fixed so that we don't have to do this. So this is the example, I think, of the, the best example of how society exists before 
of the individual. The notion that um, langu language um, precedes everybody and that nobody chooses a native language. And that's the same way for all kinds of social norms. The rules of society precede the people. You're sort of born into them. This kind of sets up a chicken and the egg problem, right? Um, obviously, society, society can't exist without people, uh, but there are no people who weren't born into a society, right? So that's kind of a chicken and egg problem. Uh, and Durkheim just sort of left it at that. But I think, you know, Ber Durkheim is a, a great example of a theorist who made correct predictions on the basis of very incomplete data. What we're finding now is that in certain animals, there are sort of proto norms and proto societies that exist. And these have sort of rules and fundamental norms uh, that are sort of sort of built in to their biology. For instance, ape society is much more sophisticated than we thought. And so unbeknownst to Durkheim, uh, evolutionary biologists and uh, evolutionary psychologists are sort of solving the chicken and egg problem by saying that, look, it's true, true that uh, everybody is born already into a society, but the blueprint for uh, societies probably exists in uh, your brains as their structure, that they're sort of structures in the brain that, uh, that help these societies get going. You know, the, the societies are very plastic and they can change in lots of different ways. Uh, but the underlying roots, rules for things like fairness and uh, reciprocity, those things exist in chimpanzees. And so we can probably infer that they exist in human ancestors. And so the Let's take a look at some of Durkheim's writings. The first book we're going to look at is called The Rules of the Sociological Method. This isn't the first book that Durkheim wrote, but it's I think the one that we should uh, tackle first to understand the way that Durkheim looks at society. And the book is exactly what the title says it's about. It's about the rules of sociological analysis. And for Durkheim, the way to start studying sociology is to look at its sort of constituent elements. And for Durkheim, society is comprised of something he calls social facts. And uh, let me read this quote. Uh, a social fact is every way of acting, fixed or not, capable of exercising on the individual an external constraint, or again, every way of acting, which is general throughout a given society, while at the same time existing in its own right, independent of its individual manifestations. Now, uh, let's unpack that, because first of all, it's written in long sentences that uh, are difficult in English, and it's translated from French. So what does Durkheim mean? Remember way back in our discussion of August Comte, we talked about social structure uh, and the way that social structures are impede or facilitate movement through society. Well, social facts are sort of the way that Durkheim describes social structures. And they are elements of society that shape and mold behavior. And for Durkheim, they exist external to the individual. That is, they exist out there. Remember how we talked about language is ex existing external to the people who speak the language. It might as well be out there. It's sui generis. Social facts are the same way. They are external to the individual and they constrain people's behaviors. So let me give you an example of a social fact. Um, there you know, you can you can walk across the border between Arizona and New Mexico and you'll never know that you just entered a different complete jurisdiction and a complete state with all kinds of different laws. So uh, you can't see the border between Arizona and New Mexico and the border between Arizona and New Mexico, you know, is a completely made up arbitrary thing that somebody just put on a map, but because everybody agrees that the border between Arizona and Mexico is in a particular spot and that it matters, it constrains our behavior. The border is a made-up social thing, but it's external to everybody that uh, uh, lives in either 
Arizona or New Mexico, and it constrains their behavior. And there are sanctions uh, against those who violate the reality of social facts. So, for instance, in, in Colorado, I can walk into a store and just buy marijuana. No big deal. And I can take it home and smoke it. It's completely legal. In the state next door, you can't do anything of the sort. And you will go to uh, jail, be arrested, if you're found uh, possessing marijuana. So the imaginary border, uh, the political border between uh, Colorado and Utah, is not something that's visible, and it's something that's completely made up and arbitrary. But it is external to people, and it constrains their behavior. Or think about something like... Um, Valentine's Day as a social fact. It's just a holiday that somebody made up, but because we all agree uh, that Valentine's Day is a really real thing, real thing, you better back buy a card for your significant other. Or, you know, the idea that we celebrate anniversaries is completely arbitrary. Why do we celebrate wedding anniversaries? It's just a tradition that we do, and it's a tradition that predates all of us, and we don't know who invented that. So in that way, it's sort of external our behavior, but uh, it constrains your behavior because you don't want to forget your uh, anniversary. So that's the essential element of social facts. They are external to individuals, and they constrain individuals. So the thing about social facts is they're socially created. Political borders are socially created. Holidays are socially created. They're human creations, but they become reified. Uh, they're subjective uh, in terms of they're, you know, just made up. They only exist in our minds or the products of our minds. Um, but once we all agree, once there's consensus about something like a political border or something like a holiday, then those subjective social facts that exist really only in minds or the products of our minds take on the character of objective reality. They might as well be really real. They might These social things might as well be as real as rocks and trees and objective things in the environment because they coerce us and constrain us in the same kinds of ways. So... Uh, and once they take on this character of objective reality, they act back upon us. So let's think about some examples of social facts and how they are subjective uh, and made up, but then they sort of become uh, objective reality. So think about driving on the right-hand side of the road. If you're in the United States, you drive on the right hand side, you drive on the right-hand side uh, of the road. And you don't even think about it. It's second nature to you. Um, but we know that driving on the right-hand side of the road isn't the objectively correct way to drive. We know that there's nothing sort of decreed in the heavens that says, uh, thou shalt drive on the right-hand side of the road. And how do we know this? Because in many nations around the globe, people drive on the left-hand side of the road, and they do just fine. It doesn't really matter what side of the road you drive on ultimately, but once everybody in society decides that this is the side of the road we're driving on, then it becomes really real. And if you don't think that the social fact of driving on the right-hand side of the road is important, go ahead and violate that and see what will happen to you. In fact, driving on the right-hand side of the road is so second nature that uh, people report that when they re rent a car in London, try and drive. It's a horrific, scary, when Americans rent cars in London, it's a horrific, scary thing uh, because you're not used to uh, turning right across traffic, for example. Or think about something as fundamental as time. Uh, you know, the, we all agree that it is, you know, 8.30, you know, 8.30. Um, but that is a completely arbitrary thing. There's nothing in the heavens that says it is objectively 8.30. And we know that because when it's 8.30 in the Eastern time zone in the United States, it's three hours back in California and it's uh, several hours. We all agree, though, that in this particular place, that's the time. When I go to visit my parents, I set my clock back uh, two hours. Or think about daylight savings time where we all agree that it's this time and then we all agree that it's either an hour back from that time or an hour ahead 
of that time. So of that time. So what time it is uh, is a complete social construction. But you can't say, you know, you, when your alarm goes off at 5:30 a.m., you can't say to yourself, "Well, I learned that time was just a, you know, subjective social construction, so I'm going to just set my clock back." No. Uh, it's not an individual thing. It's a collective thing. When we collectively decide to move our clocks back, that's fine. But when you individually decide, uh, it, it would not work. That's why they call them social facts. Um, this is why, as a sociologist, New Year's Eve never did much for me. Because there's no point uh, Earth's uh, path around the sun that constitutes a beginning or any place where you can say, okay, here's where a new year you know, technically starts. You just pick a, part, uh, a, a spot on that orbit and you say, okay, this, const you know, this constitutes the new year. We're going to call this January 1st. But that's any sort of new year because the Jewish new year is a, a different day. and The Chinese new year is a different day. We just all agree that January 1st is New Year's. And the interesting thing about New Year's Eve celebrations, like I said, my family is uh, lives in two time zones away, so they're two hours back. And on, and on New Year's Eve, I generally, you know, uh, uh, put on my party hat and sing, uh, say Happy New Year and sing Old Ang, old ang Syne. And then uh, when the party uh, it starts to uh, kick into overdrive, I usually find some sort of quiet place to call um, my mom and tell her mom and tell her happy new year because it's not quite the new year there and I want to call her before the new year kicks in and that leads me as a sociologist to say that the new year is just completely made up which makes sociologists no fun to be with at New Year's Eve party um, but it's uh, it helps you sort of understand that in many respects um, you know uh, society is kind of fake. Um, almost everything that we do socially is just a made-up contrivance. Uh, but that really doesn't matter because once we all agree on those contrived aspects of society, they're really not contrived anymore. They're actually really real. Really real. Now, taken together, all of these social facts constitute what we would call the normative order or what Durkheim called the collective conscience or the collective consciousness. Now, uh, the, the use of this term doesn't really make the trip in English. In French, it's a pun, conscience collective. And this word conscience can mean both consciousness, collective consciousness, what we're collectively aware of, and conscience, our collective conscience. Uh, it's the same word uh, in French. So this is Durkheim's idea uh, uh, about how social facts uh, Another thing that Durkheim talked about is the way in which a person's position in society determines the way that that person thinks. Now, in sociology, we call this the concept of social location. And the easiest way to think about social location, location is to make an analogy with physical location. So think about the ways that I can specify my uh, physical location. I could say that I am uh, on planet Earth, in the Western Hemisphere, continent of North America, in the United States of America, state of Florida, Duval County, and I can move from a very general uh, description of my physical location to an extremely precise description of my physical location, right down to the very room that I'm in. And the interesting thing about people who share the same physical location is that they tend to see the same things. I mean, if you were sitting here right now, you'd see my computer and my bookcases and the pictures that my daughter has drawn for me that I put on the wall. If people who share the same physical location experience uh, reality the same way, see the same things. Well, social location works the same way. Uh, everybody is located at, at a particular point in society. Everyone has uh, an ethnic identity, a gender, a age, social class, religion, um, uh, language. These are all aspects uh, of a person's social location. And just as people who share the same physical location see the same things, 
people who share the same social location see the world the same way. So social location determines your consciousness. Now this is quite a contrast to Marx. Remember, Marx believed that the ideas of the ruling class were the ruling ideas. Marx believed, for instance, that working people subscribed to the mentality of the capitalist and that they were held in thrall by false consciousness. So for Marx, uh, it's true that society shapes your consciousness, but really there is a true consciousness and there is a false consciousness and your uh, whether your consciousness is true or false or the way your consciousness is determined has to do with your means of production. So that's the way that Marx would think about how social structure determines your thinking. Durkheim doesn't see it that way at all. Durkheim sees society as comprised of many different vantage points. Like the rich see the world one way and the poor see the world uh, another way. And men see the world, world one way and women see the world uh, another way. And religious people see the world uh, one way and non-religious people see the world another way. And those are vantage points that those people um, are positioned in a particular spot and they see the world a particular way and it's just a way of see seeing the world. So for Durkheim there is no false consciousness. There's just multiple consciousnesses uh, everybody has a different perspective, and those perspect no one perspective is objectively right. And people see the world the way they see it based on their vantage point. Just as if you were, you know, standing on the top of a tower or at the bottom of the tower or positioned to one side of the tower, and you're all looking at the same thing, everybody would see a different aspect of the thing. So, uh, you know, think about. Um, something like uh, the relationship between a cheetah and a, 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 if you could, if cheetahs were sentient and you said to the cheetahs, you know, look at your killing and eating these poor gazelles. How do you justify yourselves? Uh, the cheetahs would say, look, we're, you know, we're not bad for the, we have to eat. And this is, you know, we have a particular right to life too. And if you think about it, we're really not bad, not bad for the gazelles because you don't get eaten uh, unless you're the slowest gazelle. So you don't have to be the fastest gazelle to survive. You just can't be the slowest gazelle. And so in a way, we cheetahs make the gazelle herds healthier and faster uh, by culling the herd. So being a cheetah is a noble thing, even though we eat gazelle meat. Gazelle meat. And the cheetah is perfectly justified in saying that. Uh, but then if you ask the gazelle, so tell me what you think of cheetahs, think of what the gazelles would say. Well, that's the same thing in our society. Uh, different people with different vantage points see things different way. The old see things differently from the young. The generation gap is a matter of disparate social locations, people with different priorities, people seeing the world uh, in different ways. And for Durkheim, it's not a matter of who's right or who's wrong. It's a, just a matter of different ways of uh, seeing things. And so that is how he describes social location. Let's keep the idea of social location <clears throat> and the notion that social location determines the contours of individual consciousness. As we move into a discussion of Durkheim's next book, The Division of Labor in Society, which was actually Durkheim's doctoral dissertation. Not very many people write a doctoral dissertation that becomes an enduring classic, but Durkheim did. And in The Division of Labor, Durkheim talks about uh, his ideas about the transition from primordial social forms to modern social forms and the role that social location and the way that social location determines consciousness is relevant. So just to recap, social location determines the contours of consciousness. It provides a vantage point. But within every society, there are certain social facts that comprise the collective consciousness, uh, that which the members of society uh, believe and hold in common. And Durkheim examines the difference between the nature and extent of collective consciousness in traditional societies versus modern societies, and that's where we're going to turn our attention now. So this model is my attempt to graphically display the difference between collect collective consciousness 
in a traditional society and a modern society. And what I've done is divided the segments of society into sets. And with you at the middle here and then the other people in your society um, constituting these various sets. And the colored circles represent those sets, the set of all people who live near you, the set of all people who share your religious beliefs, the set of all people who are in your kin group, the set of all people who share your ethnicity, and the set of all people who speak your language. And what you see is that in the traditional society, all of these sets are consolidated. These are all the same people. You live by the people that you worship with. You worship by the people that are your same, speak your same language and share your ethnicity. And those people are your uh, extended uh, family. And you're linked to them through blood and marriage. So in a traditional society, all aspects of life are intertwined. Of propinquity, religion, kin, ethnicity, language. And so if we think about social location as a vantage point in society, how many social locations are there here in the traditional society? Not that many. There's no religious pluralism. Uh, and so uh, really there is no challenge to religious ideology. I mean, there are no competing ideologies, so everybody completely buys into their religious dogma. Uh, Everybody is related. Uh, everybody knows everybody personally. Everybody knows everybody else. And so if it is the case that people who share the same lo lo social location see the world in similar ways, when there are very few social locations in society, almost everybody sees society the same way. So what happens is, you know, everybody has the same biography. If you were doing public opinion polling in a society like this, you'd only need to hand out one survey and then you could generalize to the whole society. There's little intergenerational change. There's just a high degree uh, of consensus in a society like this. So traditional societies are held together by, by these consolidated social networks and social bonds that span uh, across all different social structures. By contrast, look at the modern society. If you are a typical urban American, the people in your neighborhood are not the people. And the people who you go to church with maybe aren't all of your ethnicity. And the people that uh, you are related to don't live by you. Everything is, the, instead of consolidated social uh, circles, these are cross-cutting. And so you have um, a distinctly different than vantage points and points of view. And so imagine a situation where if I am a Catholic, I might be at a pro-life rally with my friend who is a Baptist because we're both pro-life on the issue of abortion. But we differ with respect to the death penalty because Catholics oppose the death penalty and Baptists don't. So you can see uh, that things are different in the modern society. You have uh, things that would be um, unthinkable in an ancient traditional society. For instance, people switching their religion, people in the same family with different religions, a husband who is one religion and a wife who is another. That kind of thing would have been uh, something you couldn't even think about in the traditional society. And so this is the difference between uh, the structure and the number of social locations and the nature of the collective conscience. Uh, consciousness, traditional societies versus modern societies. So let's take a minute and talk about some of these features of traditional societies first. Obviously, we live in a modern society, and so when you think about traditional societies, you're often thinking about the past. But there are some subcultures that exist within modern society that are sort of throwbacks or relics to what it might have been like uh, in uh, earlier times. And so here are a couple of pictures of some of these societies that exist in the United States today. Uh, in the upper left, you see the Amish. And in the bottom right, you see Mormon fundamentalist polygamists that live on the uh, Utah-Arizona uh, border. And these societies have many of the characteristics of the traditional society. They, you'll notice that they all dress alike uh, and they all behave alike. 
And because they all dress alike and behave alike, you know, the way that you think follows your behavior. They tend to think alike. The Amish are incredibly cohesive. The Mormon fundamentalist polygamists are essentially shut off from the larger society by choice. Um, most of them uh, are independent contractors so that they don't have to work for any sort of company. They use a lot of solar energy and wind to power their communities. And so the idea is that the hallmark of these traditional societies and, and what, what holds them together is a very powerful sense of us. Uh, and this strong sense of us um, gives them a lot of advantages and social cohesion. Um, and what ends up happening in a society like this is that when you have a strong sense of us, you, you know, you don't have any existential crisis. You don't wonder about, you know, who am I and where do I fit in? They all know who they are and they all know how they fit in. And so, uh, these societies are, um, unique in that way. They're much cohesive. Um, they're much more, um, collectivized than our society. So keep that in mind, a strong sense of us. One way to help us understand what an incredible resource the strong sense of us is in traditional societies is to look for ways that we produce it in our own modern society and the way we tap into the strong sense of us to get things done. The best example of how you can manufacture a strong sense of us is the United States military. Now think about what happens when you join the Marine Corps. The first thing you do is you go to boot camp. And uh, as you can see from these pictures in boot camp or in the military, they suppress the individual in favor of the group. So I like to think about the ratio of me to us that exists in any individual. Right now, we all think of ourselves as a me and much less as an us. And what happens when you join the military is the notion of me is sublimated and the notion of us takes precedence. And that's kind of the way things are in traditional societies. Uh, us matters a lot more than me. In our modern society, me matters a lot more than us uh, in most cases. Now, why does the military need to produce this strong sense of us. Well, um, think about what you're asking people in the military to do. You're asking them to risk their life. You're asking people who are essentially strangers to each other. They're not family. Uh, they're not neighbors. You're asking them to put their lives in each other's hand and fight together as a team. Uh, it's, you know, the idea of uh, celebrating the individual is antithetical to being effective in battle. And for that reason, the military strips away individual variation. You can't uh, go to, Mar to Marine Corps boot camp and say to the sergeant, well, you know, that hairstyle doesn't really flatter me. I prefer not to wear my hair that way. Uh, you can't talk back to authority. You can't say, well, you know, the color of these fatigues doesn't really, you know, uh, do anything for me. I'd like to try a few different colors, right? You you um, blend into the group, and the idea of uh, me is uh, pushed into the background, and the idea of us is foregrounded. And that's the kind of social arrangement that you see generally in traditional societies. There are the people uh, have the same kinds of feelings towards each other, the same kind of similarities, the same kind of um, uh, unanimity and purpose that you see uh, among recruits in boot camp. Nevertheless, there is a downside to the strong sense of us because you simply can't have a strong sense of us without a strong sense of them. And so what always ends up happening in these strong, cohesive collectives is that, they are, is that they are internally cohesive, but they tend to be bellicose with outsiders. Uh, they see them as the other, and they need to wall themselves off from other groups in order to maintain their strong sense of us. Uh, you see this with the Amish. I've just told you how cohesive the Amish, how they don't suffer from uh, the kinds of existential dilemmas that we face 
in our lives, but why aren't you willing to join the Amish? It's because there is an incredible price to, play, to pay. To be Amish means to cut yourself off from mainstream society. You can't use a car. Look at a car. Look at the way that they dress um, in uh, the Amish forbid zippers on their clothes. And what that means is that there's no kind of, of fashion, mainstream fashion, that anybody can wear. Um, or think about um, cohesive religious groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses. If you Kingdom Hall to worship uh, this Sunday, uh, those congregations are ten, uh, generally so cohesive that they'll see you and notice that you're a visitor, and they'll be very happy to have you, and they'll give you all kinds of attention, and you'll say to yourself, wow, these people really have a strong community, and they do. They have a strong sense of us. But the Jehovah's Witnesses are, are required to shun people who leave the faith. So if I'm a Jehovah's Witness, and I am enjoying that strong sense of community in my congregation, if my son decides that he's going to apostatize uh, from the uh, faith, then my obligation, obligation is to choose my church over him. My obligation is to shun him. Uh, and that is uh, an incredibly high cost to pay. And you can't have this sense of us without having uh, this sense uh, of them. And there is this uh, tendency to see people outside the group as the wicked world. So I was raised a Mormon in Utah. I think I told some of you that. And uh, uh, in my faith, the belief is that Mormonism is the only true church. And uh, when the prophet Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, had his first vision to establish his new church, he had a vision. Uh, of God, and God told him point blank, all other churches are wrong. There's no true church, and you're going to establish uh, the true church. The Book of Mormon, uh, the Book of Mormon Scripture, says that that there are only two churches: the Church of God and the Church of the Devil. And so, if the Mormon Church is the Church of God, and you're not a Mormon, what's your church? And that is uh, really, I think. Um, uh, the point that Durkheim wants to make here, and that is that, you know, there, there, there are always trade-offs. We want community. We want cohesion. But you can't define yourself as us unless there is a them that you can compare yourself to. So there's a sort of tyranny in these communities. They're just not good uh, at uh, accepting any kind of Difference. They're not good uh, at uh, accepting nonconformists or iconoclasts. Whereas in modern society, we celebrate the individual and we don't have any kind of social cohesion. But you're much more free to do what you what you want to do. You can dress the way you want. You can wear your hair the way you want. You can join whatever church you want. And so this idea of a sense of us and a sense of individualism. Um, work uh, as countervailing forces. And the more you have of one, the less you have of the other. Each one of these things, um, cohesion and individualism, has uh, advantages for people and disadvantages. For Durkheim, <clears throat> these traditional homogeneous societies are characterized by something that he calls mechanical solidarity. And in mechanical solidarity, the glue that holds people together is interchangeability. Remember, because people think alike, because people uh, behave alike, people are more or less interchangeable. So if you imagine a basic hunter-gatherer band, one of the first kinds of human societies, uh, everybody in a hunter-gatherer band is either a hunter uh, or a gatherer. So, so if we're all hunters, and you get sick, uh, I know what to do. I can do your job. If, you know, if you are a gatherer and you get sick, uh, I know which plants are edible. I know where to find uh, the things that we eat. And so the society is held together because every single person is interchangeable. Right? Interchangeability is the glue. Uh, and that is the uh, essence of mechanical solidarity. And Durkheim says 
uh, imagine a, a simple society like a hunting and gathering society and imagine the stock knowledge of that society. And here I've sort of characterized this by a diagram. The circle on the top that's labeled stock knowledge is essentially everything there is to know about the society. All of our uh, traditions, all of our religion, our kinship system, the way we prepare our foods, the songs we sing, uh, that's everything there is to know in our society. And below you see the different shaded um, circles represent different individuals. And uh, I want to show you how Dirk Durkheim characterizes the difference between the stock knowledge or his idea of collective conscience uh, or consciousness and any individual's consciousness. So we'll see that um, next. So here what I've done is taking the stock knowledge of society, everything there is to know, essentially the uh, collective consciousness, and I have uh, overlaid each individual on top of this collective consciousness and on top uh, of each other, the semi-opaque uh, circles. What I'm trying to characterize here is that the stock knowledge of society, everything that there is to know in the society, all of the expertise, all of the rituals, is pretty much coterminous with what any given individual knows. So uh, everybody knows everything there is to know about the society. So not, not only are individuals interchangeable, but uh, individ in terms of their jobs, but individual consciousness is interchangeable. I mean, you could literally just take the brains of people uh, and uh, randomly distribute them into other heads and societies wouldn't change that much. You can see there's just a tiny sliver of individual uh, knowledge here. And virtually everything that I know, everybody else in society knows. And virtually everything that everybody else in society knows, I know. And that really is the uh, incredible power of um, uh, mechanical, mechanical solidarity. Because when individual consciousness is interchangeable like this, there's no notion of the self apart from the group. There is no sense of yourself as an individual. And that's when you see this kind of sublimation of the self, societies are able to organize in powerful ways. So, for instance, think about um, a beehive. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about honeybees is if they sting you, they die. They got one sting. But yet if the hive is attacked, um, honeybees will line up to essentially suicide bomb you with their stingers. There aren't any bees that are like, well, maybe I should hang back, or well, I should do a cost-benefit analysis of this. No, uh, that's not the way that it works, because bees uh, are invested in the hive and not invested in themselves. And it's the same kind of thing that you see in mechanical solidarity, that people don't take any thought, thought for their own individual welfare, uh, they're primarily or ultimately concerned with the group welfare because they don't even perceive of themselves as individuals apart from the group. So you have a stronger bond between an individual and a society than you have bonds between individuals. And that is something that's unique. And that's how Durkheim describes mechanical solidarity. Now compare this to the way Durkheim characterizes modern societies. Think about how much there is to know in our society versus how much there is to know in a hunting and gathering society. When uh, uh, we went to the office of the attorney to sign the papers for our mortgage, uh, in his um, conference room he had on the wall a bookcase filled with the legal code of Florida. And it filled a wall. The legal code of Florida essentially filled a wall. And that's just the laws from one state. Think of all the scholarship we produce. We produce. Think of all the literature. Think of, you know, all of the different religions with all of their different theologies. In terms of how much there is to know in our society, there's uh, exponentially more than there would be in a primordial hunting and gathering society. And so... There's so much knowledge. No one person can have any kind of grasp uh, of that knowledge. And so what ends up happening is we're specialized. Uh, and specialization means that our consciousness doesn't overlap with other people. 
So I'm a sociologist and a college professor, and I and I teach at a university, and uh, I know the things that I know. And my wife is a high school Spanish teacher, and she teaches at a high school, and she sort of knows my coworkers. And I sort of know her coworkers, and I I sort of tell her what my day is like, and she sort of tells me what her day is like. But what's interesting is that the person I know best in the world, my wife. I don't know as well as any hunter-gatherer would know any other hunter-gatherer. I have less insight into how my wife thinks than I would any other hunter-gatherer in the tribe because in solidarity, individual consciousness is essentially interchangeable. Right? So this idea of specialization in organic solidarity means that the glue that holds society together isn't interchangeability. It's interdependence. We've divided the labor and we depend on each other. Uh, uh, I can't fly, fly a plane, uh, but the pilot probably couldn't give a lecture on Durkheim. And so what uh, Durkheim says is that in organic solidarity, the parts of society are like organs in the body. And just as there's a division of labor in the body, uh, the heart pumps the blood and, uh, and uh, the stomach digests the food and uh, these organs in the body depend on one another to keep the body whole, and it's the same way uh, in society, that people are uh, interdependent on one another. Um, and so what you see is that there is historically a from mechanical solidarity to organic solidarity, that mechanical solidarity precedes organic solidarity in time. Um, and Durkheim uses, he, the reason why he calls it organic solidarity is he explicitly makes this analogy to the body and to uh, the biological organism, whole organism. And if you think about it, mechanical solidarity is like the single-celled organism society. And organic solidarity, like we have today, is sort of, you know, a, a, an endothermic mammal. So one kind of society evolves into the other. And the move from, from mechanical solidarity to organic solidarity is an evolutionary trend. It's an evolutionary process. But for Durkheim, uh, he doesn't see it in any sort of value-laden way. Like Organic solidarity is not superior to uh, mechanical solidarity. It's just different. Mechanical solidarity is not superior to organic solidarity. It's just different. We've already said that the advantages to mechanical solidarity are social cohesion, but the disadvantage is it's tyrannical against people who don't conform. Well, in organic solidarity, it's the, it's the exact opposite. Individual expression, um, but really no strong sense of us. Look at how little overlap there is between my consciousness and the collective consciousness, or my consciousness and the consciousness of my wife, or my coworkers, or my neighbors. Um, and so this, evolu this evolutionary trend is not something that he sees in value-laden terms. Remember, Comte said that we move from a primitive theological stage to an advanced positivism. And Spencer saw survival of the fittest leading, leading to a more perfect society. Durkheim says, no, uh, one is not best. Their advantages and their disadvantages, they're just different. Now, what causes it? Uh, why would it change? Why would we move from mechanical solidarity to organic solidarity? Remember, Marx had his mechanisms for how we got from primordial uh, communalism, uh, communalism um, to capitalism. Um, Comte has his stages. How does evolution work for Durkheim? And Durkheim argues that uh, the important things, the important processes of evolution are two things. Number one, something he calls dynamic density and something he calls moral density. So let's tell the story of this societal evolution and you'll hear that it's very similar to the story that we told with Marx, only there are some twists here. So let's imagine the primordial hunter-gatherer society. And let's imagine that this is a band level society and every, and every morning the hunters get up to hunt and uh, the gatherers uh, start gathering. And uh, imagine that I 
am a lousy hunter and I can never bring home any game. But I make the best arrows and I have the best bow. My tools are the best tools, but I'm just not good at using them. And my neighbor, Og, here, he always brings home game, but he has a horrible looking bow and crooked arrows, dull arrowheads. And so one day it occurs to me that perhaps I shouldn't go hunting. Perhaps what I should do is make arrows and provision the hunters so that they will have better equipment when they go out hunting. And that is the beginning of the process of moving from organic solidarity to mechanical solidarity, the division of labor, uh, dividing labor up. Now, this is similar with respect to what Marx had to say. Only Marx thought that this was a bad thing. Uh, Mar Marx said that this led to class interests and uh, um, exploitation and intergenerational inequality. What Durkheim says is no, uh, what it really does is allows for the emergence of individual consciousness. Remember, your consciousness is molded by your social location. And remember that in primordial societies we talked about how the collective consciousness and an individual consciousness are coterminous. Well, now we have arrow maker consciousness and hunter consciousness. Now we have things that hunters know that the arrow makers don't know and things that the arrow makers know that the hunters don't know. Different vantage points. It's not better. It's not worse. It's just different. It doesn't necessarily need to lead to conflict. So then say, you know, I say, well, I'm neither a good hunter nor a good arrow maker, but look at the quality of the shoes that I make. Wouldn't it be better if I sat back and made the shoes and uh, uh, as somebody else made the arrows and the hunters have the better shoes and the better arrows. And so what ends up happening is we're more successful uh, in terms of getting game. We have uh, more food that comes in. And remember from Thomas Malthus, if you increase the resource base, you increase the population. So you have a lot of population that provides uh, pressure on um, the society to continue to be more and more productive. And so uh, we uh, look through the, the young people in the tribe to see who has aptitude for an arrow make, uh, for arrow making and who has aptitude for shoemaking and who has aptitude for, for hunting. And we differentiate into jobs and we become interdependent. Instead of interchangeable, as in mechanical solidarity, we become interdependent in uh, organic solidarity. And this causes us to have uh, a sense of ourselves as individuals uh, rather than just um, a, a, a part of the group. There's an individual consciousness that's distinct from the group consciousness. And once that happens, this process of population pressure leading to, um, leading to differentiation uh, and division of labor leads to, and that's called dynamic density. And dynamic density leads to moral density. Once we have individuals who have different points of view, we share information, we talk, there's an increase in the frequency of, and intensity of interaction, and communication sort of gets the ball rolling. And now we have a society where the division of labor is considered to be a good thing, and we want to divide labor more, and we seek productivity by becoming more differentiated and more interdependent. And that is the evolutionary process that takes us from uh, a homogeneous, homogeneous primordial traditional societies to a he heterogeneous um, modern societies. This chart here shows uh, the number of significant technological advances that have taken place since the arrival of the Industrial Revolution in the mid-18th century. It's kind of hard to see, uh, but what it shows is that once you have dynamic density and moral density combined, you have this exponential growth in uh, technological sophistication. So society begins to get more and more complex, uh, uh, faster and faster and faster. And so the move to organic solidarity essentially flips a switch and then society takes off. So you can see 
you know, life was fairly stable uh, for long periods of time, uh, stretching back into hunter-gatherer days, and then you reach a certain point of societal complexity, and then things really, uh, really take off. Again, uh, Durkheim doesn't think this is a good thing necessarily. There are a lot of bad things that come from it. In a subsequent unit, we're going to talk about Durkheim's theory of suicide, and he will talk about how all of this technological uh, complexity and atomized division of labor can lead to psychological problems uh, and can cause people to uh, be disconnected from one another in ways that can cause uh, psychological pathologies. So uh, we'll look forward to talking about that another time.